On May 18, 1980, a catastrophic geologic event occurred that not only shocked the world because of its explosive power, but it changed the way we think about geology. I call it uh, Mount St. Helens Rosetta Stone of Catastrophist Geology, or um, um, something like that. You know, you know what the Rosetta Stone was? It was a uh, a, a translation in cuneiform and in Greek uh, that allowed us to understand the ancient Egyptian language. And uh, that's what uh, ge uh, catastrophist geology is. It's a kind of a language that's been sitting there and it's been discovered because Mount St. Helens is the Rosetta Stone to help us uh, decipher the uh, uh, field. Here's my animation of the profile of the volcano before the eruption, before the 1980 eruption, before 9,677 feet. Now it's 8,365 feet after Mount St. Helens, Rosetta Stone of Catastrophist Geology. There it was, volcano in full eruption on May 18th, 1980, 40 years ago. And we can look back and say, hey, what, what have we learned about this an enormous experience? It's recognized to be the, uh, uh, one of the most significant volcanic eruptions in human history because we learned so much. And it happened in a populated area and uh, it was just observed by so many people. And now that we can look back on it, we can talk about the lessons that we've learned. Uh, what we're doing at Mount St. Helens is scriptural. Come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth, Psalm 46, verse 8. And uh, I take that literally when it says, come behold the works of the Lord, I put my boots on and I get out there and uh, see the location, see the site where this all happened 40 years ago. Um, boy, is it a desolation, 150 square mile area of desolation. Psalm 46, verse eight. The eruption uh, profile before the eruption, 9,365 uh, feet. It's a very beautiful spirit lake to the north of the volcano, uh, a virgin forest. It was uh, widely acclaimed as one of the most picturesque of all of the Cascade volcanoes before the eruption. After the eruption, it lost 1,300 feet of summit elevation, as well as the north slope, which slid away in a gigantic landslide at 832.17 on May 18, 1980. Earthquake shook the mountain, the whole north slope slid off the mountain and the summit behind it. And 23 square miles of landslide debris was deposited as uh, the steam explosion occurred. It was like uncorking the bottle. There was a giant water wave on Spirit Lake over there on the, uh, uh, on the left side of the image, 865 feet. The uh, lake sloshed back into its new basin with a new landslide debris dam. During the nine hour eruption, there was uh, major mud flows and pyroclastic flows and airfall tephra. It was uh, just a, an amazing event. And uh, that um, is there for us to study. Here's the, uh, the image of the summit five minutes before the explosion. And then I can show it to you in short sequence. Here's the patch together of the still photography in real time. You see the north slope beginning to slide as earthquake shakes a whole mountain. The north uh, slope begins to fail. Then the summit fails. And then super hot liquid water inside the magma that's inside the volcano flashed to steam. And we had a steam blast equivalent to 
to uh, 20 million tons of TNT that blasted out northward over the landscape, not up, but northward, horizontally directed blast over the landscape. Within 10 minutes, it leveled 150 square miles of forest. So that's the uh, and uh, that those are the real uh, photographs of the uh, that have been sequenced roughly in real time. You can see a little bit of that. You see the whole whole North Slope sliding, and uh, the, as the North Slope slid, glaciers were exposed and gigantic rock avalanche. We call it a debris avalanche, uh, and it covered a uh, 23 square mile area with uh, avalanche debris. Okay, and then you see at about 30 seconds, you start seeing a puff of uh, steam coming out of the summit and then the, the middle of the slope. The steam explosion becomes extreme and then um, the steam explosion overtops the landslide material. The landslide debris avalanche is moving at 100 miles per hour, but the steam blast is moving much faster in places at the nozzle, it's supersonic, but slowing down as it's moving out from the uh, volcano. The uh, big uh, uh, steam explosion equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT. That day on May 18th, 1980, the total energy output of the volcano was something like uh, four, 100,000 tons of TNT, um, maybe atomic bomb a second, something like that. And there you're seeing uh, at rocks being thrown out ballistically. There are new islands in Spirit Lake. <laughs> they, uh, uh, so some of those are big rocks uh, landed uh, miles from the volcano. Okay, here's the image before the eruption from exactly the same place i've got the camera positioned and took this photograph after the eruption before the eruption exactly the same place after it's uh hard to believe that you're looking at the same landscape because things have changed so much but uh keep uh, an eye on this right here, that little shoulder there, and this shoulder over here. That'll convince you you're looking at the same thing. Okay, that's after. Here's before again. I'll come back to before. See that shoulder right there? And see that shoulder over there? This whole foreground has radically altered. And then the basin in front is filled with all that debris. And this slope here with a forest on it is, uh, it, it's, it's lost its forest. That's before, after. Radical change, especially with the, uh, the summit and uh, North Slope landslide, uh, up to 600 feet of deposits of landslide debris in the, in the foreground area. And of course, the, uh, the steam blast uh, overtop these ridges and leveled the remaining forest um, over um, 150 square miles. Before, after. What uh, has happened? And that's what's obvious. Now, Northern Lights Production made a simulation of uh, this event and um, I'll run it, the first 50 seconds. Earthquake. Debris avalanche. The debris avalanche is a, is a moving rock slide. The moving rock slide uncorks the magma in the uh, base of the volcano, and then the steam explosion occurs. There's a debris avalanche, and there's the steam explosion overtopping the landslide debris. Uh, about Spirit Lake area, as the giant water wave is developing on the lake, uh, the, the steam blast is going over the top of it. 
That's the first 50 seconds, a simulation. And it's well done. The, the uh, uh, animators did a good job, and they, they obviously had a geologist helping them out. Let's try it one more time. I could show it one more time. There it is. Okay, there's the magnitude 5.2 earthquake under the summit. The uh, summit begins to slide. It forms a debris avalanche, a stream or slurry of rock that is uh, moving at 100 miles per hour off the summit. And then there's the steam, jetting steam behind it. The steam equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT blasted over the landscape. And there it is, the, uh, the volcano after the eruption. Giant water wave on Spirit Lake, the landslide debris over top Johnson Ridge here in the foreground, you can see the hummocky landslide material. Uh, a quarter of the landslide material went into Spirit Lake Basin, uh, directly north, a little bit of it, uh, three quarters of the landslide material went uh, deflected by the ridge and stayed in the North Fork of the Tootle River Basin. Then it was volcano in full eruption. For nine hours on May 18, it erupted equivalent to 400, or um, yeah, that day, equivalent to 400 million tons of TNT blast energy, something like 20,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. Since there's a 20,000 seconds in nine hours, that's an atomic bomb a second. That's the power output of Mount St. Helens during full eruption. Yet it was just a small to average volcano from the standpoint of human experience and history. There have been a lot bigger volcanoes even in human history, but this one was uh, right in uh, front of us and it was a learning experience for us all. Yellowstone is a huge volcanic explosion. The Yellowstone caldera, pardon me, Yellowstone caldera is uh, this uh, huge uh, elliptical depression that is a collapsed volcano. Something like tw uh, 2,000 times the size of Mount St. Helens, something like that. That's a big volcano. And so Yellowstone is a um, um, a colossal volcano. Those kind of those kind of eruptions. I thank God we don't have those today. But anyway, the Yellowstone is a giant collapsed volcano. I call it a super volcano. And super volcanoes all around us. We can see that that catastrophic volcano action has left an enormous impact on the surface of the Earth. Yellowstone, uh, two thousand times Mount St. Helens. Uh, energy. Uh, mud flows on six major rivers downstream from Mount St. Helens. These mud flows were fast moving and uh, they um, devastated areas tens of miles below the volcano where people thought they were safe from uh, the volcano. The mud flow uh, devastated their valley. Dozens of bridges were washed away. Farms were overcome. Um, it, the mud flows were the most amazing uh, dollar damage, at least, from uh, the eruption. And I think the mud flows are, uh, uh, tell us a lot of story about how landscapes have formed. Uh, stratification was formed rapidly at Mount St. Helens, and maybe that's uh, an important take-home feature for us to remember. Um, the area directly north of the volcano, the pumice plain, and the debris avalanche area was the site of up to 600 feet of deposits since 1980. Landslide debris and especially pyroclastic flows. 
And pyroclastic flows are these glowing avalanche uh, slurries of, of pulverized rock particles and steam, which form dense, fast moving slurries. And the, the, uh, the movement of these pyroclastic flows is uh, very interesting to me. And uh, they're, they're um, hard to experience. They kill more geologists than any other uh, natural hazard. Pyroclastic flows uh, next to volcanoes are very unpredictable. And uh, more geologists have died in pyroclastic flow than any other volcano related phenomena. But when these pyroclastic flows cease, they leave on the ground surface these lobes, and you see the lobes of flow material. And these were uh, high velocity flows that freeze rapidly as they lose their steam pressure and they uh, solidify in forming these uh, granular deposits. And uh, in cross section, those granular deposits are very interesting. Here you see a cliff, and the cliff exposure shows you the uh, strata which have formed since 1980. And uh, here you see the upper part of the airfall tephra from May 18, 1980. The afternoon, about uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., is when this uh, granular material is falling from airfall onto the plot uh, form north of the volcano. And so you see the, uh, the, the airfall debris uh, from late afternoon, uh, May 18, 1980. Then we have a 25 foot thickness of layered deposits from June 12th, 1980. On June 12, 1980, between 9 p.m. and midnight, the radar at Portland was showing dense clouds over the north slope of the volcano. As the pyroclastic flows were issuing out, they formed this deposit 25 feet in thickness in three hours, three hour formation process that took. And uh, come back to that, and we'll look at it in detail. Then you see the March 19th, 1982 mud flow deposits on, on top So uh, of that. And that's 10, 15 feet thick. And so every layer at Mount St. Helens has a date, which is cool. And you can uh, see and study these features. Uh, here's the uh, June 12th, 1980, the upper half of it. And you see the uh, uh, partic particulate material, uh, broken uh, volcanic shards, um, much of it sand size and coarser, and uh, it's layered and it's laminated. Notice that. And uh, the closer you get to the June 12th, 1980 deposit, the more layered it becomes. Take a look at this. Uh, lamination and layering formed rapidly in a hurricane. Okay, this is moving at 100 miles per hour, the flow, the granular material is being, um, as a slurry, a gas charge slurry being uh, launched over that surface and it formed that. I had thought that a catastrophe would mix the coarse and the fine material and not separate it out into different layers. And uh, boy, was I wrong. There at Mount St. Helens, we can see granular slurries are able to make layered deposits very rapidly. Even micro thin lamination formed in a hurricane. Look at that. Uh, that type of particle flow is totally astounding. And we had thought that. Uh, strata layers form like between summer and winter, between wet years and dry years along the floodplain of a river, say. And the boundary between two different strata represents long periods of inactivity. And uh, so when we look at stratification at Mount St. Helens, we see what can form rapidly. And that helps us understand other layering in the earth. For example, 
the Tapit Sandstone in the bottom of Grand Canyon, uh, 350 feet thick. You see the uh, uh, the layering in the Grand Canyon uh, and the sandstone. It has some of the same sedimentary features as the pyroclastic flows at Mount St. Helens. And of course, I had been accustomed to thinking of tens of millions of years for the formation of the 300 feet thickness of sandstone, to beat sandstone in Grand Canyon. And of course, Mount St. Helens shows that that kind of flow process can make those things quite rapidly. In other words, Mount St. Helens is a window to help us understand other granular deposits like the sandstones in Grand Canyon. And not over millions of years, but in minutes. Minutes, not millions of years. Isn't that interesting to think that way? Erosion features at Mount St. Helens were formed rapidly. And uh, one of the most interesting features is that landscape uh, area. There were ancient lava flows from about 500 years old lava flow on the north slope of Mount St. Helens overlaying a volcanic ash deposit. All that was gouged out by a mud flow after the summer of 1980. Six major eruptions in the during the summer of 1980 after the May 18, 1980 eruption. And those eruptions created mud flows and the mud flows change the landscape, even hard rock erosion. There you see Lewitt Canyon, which was gouged out by mud. We see a small stream running through that canyon. Here is uh, what's called Step Canyon. And Step Canyon has an ancient volcanic ash deposit, ancient volcanic landslide deposit, ancient lava flow, all of that has been gouged out after the summer of 1980 in places up to 600 feet deep of erosion into solid rock. All of that happened by uh, mysterious agents. Uh, people uh, weren't, if you were there watching it, it would be very hazardous, but we, we can ascertain that it, it formed in the summer of 1980 largely by mud flow process. There you see these amazing erosional features. On March 19, 1982, almost two years after May 18, 1980, there was a big summit eruption. The summit eruption had behind it a lava dome with a lake in it. The lake breached and it formed a mud flow. And here's the mud flow coming down this is on March 21st. You see the remainders of the mud flow, but the mud flow split. Part of it went into Spirit Lake and eroded Lewitt Canyon. The other part of it made Step Canyon, and then it overwhelmed the 23 square mile area of the landslide deposit, the Hummocky landslide deposit on the North Fork of the Toodle River down here in the west, and it cut through there and um, breached the dam. There was uh, mud and water ponding behind a giant steam explosion pit. The big pit was overtopped. The mud spilled down from the big steam explosion pit, overtopped here. The mud spilled down the spillway and it uh, created this uh, uh, drainage and another drainage on the other side. There's um, an amazing assortment. We call this the Little Grand Canyon of the North Fork of the Toodle River. And the, uh, uh, the canyon is up to 180 feet deep. And branching canyons, tributary side canyons come together. About five uh, canyons come together uh, associated with them below the main breach. And there's this... Uh, kind of canyon land uh, topography upstream. And gully headed side canyons, cup shaped amphitheater headed side canyons. And the, the breach did not occur straight through. It has a snaky path. Look at the curving path that the, the mud flow made as it breached. 
And uh, notice the, the landscape north and south. As we looked at this terrain in 1983, we started thinking Little Grand Canyon after the, uh, the mud flow of March 19, 1982. We have a, a miniature Grand Canyon mud overtopped the landslide debris, making a 140th scale Grand Canyon. Here you see a modern stream going down through that canyon. You see some of the uh, stratification. And uh, this is the mud spillway for the Little Grand Canyon. Here's a, the right canyon. You know, there's a small stream in that canyon. It might appear that that small stream eroded that canyon one sand grain at a time over countless thousands of years. Isn't that the way we normally think about canyon erosion? And at Mount St. Helens, uh, rapid canyon erosion. This is a canyon that formed in 15 months off to the side, um, uh, off, the, off the side of the main breach. There's a man there for scale on top of that cliff, and there's a small stream. Do you think that small stream eroded that canyon? one sand grain at a time. We have the eyewitness reports, the photographic documentation that this happened rapidly, not over countless thousands of years. And it helps us understand the erosion of Grand Canyon. It looks like there was a giant lake north and east of the Grand Canyon. I call it Hopi Lake that breached its dam and it drained across the Kaibab upwarp. <laughs> and as it drained, it cut down the canyon and incised the, uh, the elevated area. And so spillover or uh, breach dam explanation for the origin of Grand Canyon is I believe the best explanation. I gave a lecture yesterday called uh, Remembering Spillover Erosion of Grand Canyon. And uh, geologists are thinking uh, about spillover as, as being an excellent explanation for the origin of Grand Canyon. And Grand Canyon, of course, is the premier erosional feature on planet Earth. And more uh, geologists have studied Grand Canyon than any other canyon on planet Earth. So Grand Canyon is crucial landscape for understanding both creationist and evolutionist paradigms for interpreting landscapes. And so Mount St. Helens helps us understand Grand Canyon. Here's the spillway at Mount St. Helens on the left. Notice the U-shaped canyon. Notice the meandering channel in the breach. You're right above the breach point looking downstream at Mount St. Helens. The same thing at Grand Canyon. You're just above the breach point looking downstream. And notice the, in Grand Canyon, the U-shaped canyon, the meandering channel. Notice you have amphitheater-headed canyons, gully-headed canyons. The uh, breach did not curve straight through. It has a snaky path. There's plateau land north and south. Mount St. Helens is uh, basically 125th to 140th scale model of uh, Grand Canyon. Here, uh, Mount St. Helens, 180 feet deep. Over at Grand Canyon, 4,200 feet deep. So uh, Grand Canyon and, and Mount St. Helens um, are related and there's it's spillway erosion, I, I believe. So Mount St. Helens helps us understand the origin of Grand Canyon and, and, and other canyons elsewhere on Earth. Logs and log deposits of Spirit Lake. I was sitting down next to the shore of Spirit Lake, eating my lunch this one day, I think it was in 1984, when four sticks floated in. You see these four little pieces of driftwood? They floated in, pardon me, they floated in in the uh, uh, in the wa uh, water, just the, the tip end was sticking up and they grounded in vertical orientation. Now, as, as I was thinking about 
the way the sticks float in Spirit Lake, a really outrageous idea came to my mind. If the sticks could float like that, how about the logs? You know, uh, a half a million logs are floating in Spirit Lake these days, um, maybe a quarter million, and maybe a million right after the eruption. Could those logs go into vertical orientation, be an upright floating log, I thought to myself. The log could sink to the bottom of the lake. The root end would be weighted down by rocks. It would infiltrate with water, become soaked. The upper part would tend to be more floatable. And so the logs could be deposited in a vertical orientation on the bottom of the lake, standing upright. And then what could happen? Well, we know that sedimentation is occurring rapidly in Spirit Lake because erosion is occurring around the lake. Uh, on the high country, so the logs be, could, could become buried in the bottom of the lake. They could either fall over and be a prone buried log, or how about this? The log could get buried in upright position, be an upright floated and buried log. And since the logs could fall out at different times, they could have their root ends buried at different strata layer levels in the bottom of the lake. You can kind of see what I was thinking as I was looking at those floating sticks by the edge of the lake. But what would happen if I uh, thought about this uh, and saw in cross section through the layers, petrified logs standing upright in the uh, deposits? I might assume that those were logs that grew on that surface. Multiple uh, forest levels grew and then they were buried. And uh, I could imagine immense periods of time between the different soil and forest developments at different levels with buried logs. But Mount St. Helens could do this whole thing very rapidly. And so here's uh, the, the surface of the lake. It's a gigantic log map. And so I had to go diving in Spirit Lake to see what it was like underneath the floating log map. Here you see the logs over in one corner of the lake. Man-made lowering of the water level of the lake has inclined the logs slightly, but they were deposited in vertical position and grounded in the shallow water area there uh, in uh, 1982 is when those logs landed uh, in vertical orientation. And then they've been slightly inclined because of man-made lowering of the lake. And uh, so this idea about how logs float is gaining credibility. How would we verify the logs are indeed floating in vertical position? We got a boat into Spirit Lake. And the boat in it, we have a sonar recorder. And we have automobile batteries that power the sonar recorder. And you lower the tow fish over the side of the boat, and the tow fish reads a profile by sonar over the bottom of the lake, and it's called side scan sonar. You can read the profile of the bottom of the lake. There's the side scan sonar. And uh, we were able to maneuver using the motorized uh, boat and uh, survey the bottom of the lake. Here you see the sonar record coming off the machine. And you see the sonar tow fish position, that line at the bottom. And then what you see open water, and then you see the first reflection from the bottom of the lake. That's maybe 25 to 50 feet of water depth there, 50 feet. And then you're looking out diagonally over the bottom of, of the lake, maybe 50 yards or so. And uh, what do you see, interesting, Here's a sonar reflector off the bottom of the lake. Here's another sonar reflector standing off the bottom of the lake. And there's a third one there. And then notice these sonar reflectors, they have a sonar shadow behind it. It even seems to have outflaring root mass. See that in the sonar shadow behind it? This pencil-like sonar uh, reflector has the sonar shadow behind it. Here's an immense sonar reflector, and look at the enormous 
sonar shadow behind it almost looks like the base of a trunk of a giant tree that's landed on the bottom of the lake. When we did the sonar survey of the bottom of the lake, we estimated something like maybe 10,000 upright objects were standing on the bottom of the lake. What would Spirit Lake look like if you drained it? It would look like a forest on the bottom of the lake with standing timber, 10,000 upright objects standing there. <laughs> it kind of looked like a forest. Yet that whole thing was not grown there. It's been redeposited. And uh, that's the incredible thing about uh, looking at the lake. So how would we verify the sonar is giving us the correct impression of the bottom of the lake? You guessed it. I'm a NAWI certified diver. There's my diving buddy. And uh, we're getting ready to go dive in the lake. And a scuba investigation of the bottom of the lake. There I am, there's my diving buddy. And look at this, here's the upright, reflect, uh, upright object, uh, upright log standing there. And there's a steaming lava dome in the background for added realism. So uh, that's uh, life at the volcano uh, when we're doing scientific research. But uh, that, uh, um, we were able to dig out the uh, base of this log. It looks like it had root mass on it and it recently landed. Underneath the log mat, looking up with my underwater camera, you can see the uh, immense, mostly Douglas fir, logs that are sitting there in this uh, floating log mat. The bark has been rubbed off. Where did the bark go? Good scientific skill. Uh, where did it go? Underneath the floating log mat, you see these upright timbers hanging down. The, uh, as you look at the top of the lake from above, you can't see the upright floaters very easily because they're concealed, but underneath the floating log mat, the upright floaters are very obvious. And uh, so you can see the prone floating log and here's the upright floaters. There's some more upright floaters back there. And so uh, the underwater uh, uh, view is very instructive to help us understand how logs float. On the bottom of the lake, right where the sonar said they would be, we found upright deposited logs. Here's the base of a tree that is embedded in uh, organic plant material, mostly uh, ground up uh, vegetation. And then here's another log that's uh, standing upright. One of these logs, I got my diving buddy on one side and I was on the other. We could not easily tip or sway it. But other logs had just recently landed and they could be easily tipped and swayed. That shows that the logs fall out at different times and have the root ends buried at different strata layers in the bottom of the lake. The roots often terminate abruptly from the base of the trunk of the tree, typically four feet or so uh, of root extension. And those roots, of course, were torn uh, out with the logs on May 18, 1980 by the gigantic steam explosion. And of course, they floated for a while and then been redeposited in the bottom of the lake. Now, this was an eight foot diameter Douglas fir log with the out flaring root mass at the, the bottom of the tree. There's a sign in Yellowstone National Park, uh, was uh, for many years at Yellowstone. Across the valleys, it says, arise the slopes of Specimen Ridge. But the forest you see there today is only the latest chapter in a remarkable story buried within the volcanic rocks that compose the mountain are 27 distinct layers of fossil floors, forests that flourished 50 million years ago. And the right side of the sign says Yellowstone's fossil forests are unique. Many stumps still stand upright where they grew millions of years ago. And the sign uh, shows you that. Um, that's a sign of Specimen Ridge, Northeastern Yellowstone National Park. Here you see uh, Specimen Ridge and looking at the volcanic strata. And in the volcanic strata there where we find the, the very beautifully petrified logs, many of them standing vertical. Here you see 
the petrified logs standing vertically outside the, the cliff, above the cliff. There's the modern forest growing there today. Here's the ancient forest, or because the logs are different strata layer levels, the root ends, different forests that grew at different times. 27 different uh, forest levels, some have said, uh, with the uh, very beautifully agatized logs. We were able to dig out the, the roots of some of these logs, and we found they often terminate abruptly three or four feet from the base of the log. They don't taper to a point, and it looks like the, the logs uh, at different strata layer levels have been re- deposited, and there's a correlating tree ring sequence between logs with a root ends buried at different strata layer levels, proving that the logs grew at the same time, even though they're rooted what appear to be different uh, levels. So, so the sign at Yellowstone National Park has been retired. The, uh, the evidence at Specimen Ridge is uh, very problematic, arguing for the supposed petrified forests at Yellowstone, multiple petrified forests. And so Mount St. Helens is un helping us understand petrified log deposits. Uh, let's talk about peat deposits of Spirit Lake. The uh, organic materials are especially abundant on the bottom of the lake because we have the floating log mat in, in the lake. Um, I've been involved with studying the origin of coal. And here you see a block of Pittsburgh coal. And uh, often been impressed when I look at coal, seeing the layers, uh, glassy sheet-like objects that form the bulk uh, structure of coal. And uh, I was thinking about the layered sheets of tree bark that appear to be in coal beds and I was thinking about the uh, swamp environment where coal has conventionally been thought to accumulate. And uh, large sheet-like objects don't uh, get preserved there. It's root-penetrated environment. Here is a, a coastal peat deposit along the shore of Nova Scotia. And you see the plant material which has built up over hundreds of years, and it uh, looks like branches hanging out of the deposit. What are those? Those are roots. Modern swamp peats are intensely root penetrated and produce this coffee grounds, the uh, mashed potatoes kind of appearance, but root intrusion. And um, modern swamp peats, do not have large sheets of tree bark like that dominate the coal beds. And I was thinking about the root penetrated nature of modern peats and um, the uh, sheets of tree bark that I was seeing in the coal bed and I was studying in Kentucky. And um, I was doing my PhD dissertation in 1979. I turned in my PhD dissertation on a floating map model for the origin of a Kentucky coal bed. The Kentucky coal bed looked like it formed from plant material, which formed underneath a floating log mat. And uh, I imagined the sheets of tree bark could be peeled off and flip, sink to the bottom and make this granular mass, but dominated by sheets of tree bark. And uh, that was my PhD dissertation. In July 1979, I defended my floating log map model for the origin of the coal bed in Western Kentucky. What happened 10 months later? Mount St. Helens exploded and made Spirit Lake into a gigantic bathtub uh, covered with floating logs. The, uh, by the way, the, the floating log mat model for the origin of coal was derived uh, from a bathtub experience, playing with soap suds in a bathtub, imagining how plant material could accumulate underneath the floating log bed. In uh, 1980, Mount St. Helens produced 
a giant log map, a million logs floated in the lake the day after May 18, 1980. I had to go diving in Spirit Lake to see what it was like underneath the floating log map. There you see the log map. Notice the, the logs floating prone there on the surface of the lake. There I am right there. There's my diving buddy, and we're getting ready to go to the bottom of the lake. We've uh, total darkness down at 50 to 100 feet down, and we're studying the sedimentary deposit at the bottom of the lake. Notice something about the logs. No bark. The bark is gone. Where did the bark go? Um, yeah, hardly any bark is seen, yet you know that it was on those trees. Where did it go? On the bottom of the lake, you can see gigantic sheets of tree bark. About 25% of the deposit is tree bark with this fine uh, coffee grounds, mashed potatoes kind of material around it. And uh, that's what the peat deposit is on the bottom of the lake. Have we seen the first step for the formation of a peat deposit on the bottom of Spirit Lake, Mount St. Helens? helps us understand how coal beds were formed. Mount St. Helens log mat provides a modern example to help us understand the origin of coal. Life flourishing in the blast zone at Mount St. Helens. Um, I was walking around in the blast zone after Mount St. Helens and I noticed some biologists were out there and we were, we were, we were talking about the regrowth and how like uh, fireweed is growing uh, over the landscape. And with sterile volcanic ash, now it's a soil that's uh, harboring all this growth from plants. And uh, in places, there were uh, snowpack that buried the uh, surface. And when the steam blast came over the top, there were seedling conifers that were packed in snow and preserved and they sprouted after the eruption and grew back in places. Here, here it is just four or five years after the eruption, you're seeing the seedling conifers growing wild on the slope. I need to go back and take another photograph from the same location, but you have 10 and 12 foot high uh, conifers uh, growing on the slope now. The whole thing is uh, radically altered by growth, plant growth. And so it helps us understand how uh, recovery occurs. There's the, uh, the pearly everlasting. Uh, there were lupins that fixed uh, nitrogen into the soil. And uh, all of this is regrowing very rapidly. And then animals have come back into the blast zone. The elk, we thought were a forest dwelling animal. Elk, you know, we, we thought they preferred the forest. And yet the elk go into the blast zone. Now, we thought they'd have a problem in the blast zone because they can't find shade. Uh, what are they going to do? They're going to they're gonna suffer heat exhaustion in the blast zone. They can't find shade. But we notice something. They have a cooling behavior. They lay down in wet soil. They cool themselves off and then they're having a good time. And what's going on? There's all this grass growing on the landscape and uh, there are more elk in the blast zone of Mount St. Helens now than around in the forest outside the blast zone. And so uh, we're seeing a um, regrowth and recovery of the blast zone that uh, helps us understand how a surface is recolonized after a catastrophe. Mount St. Helens helps us understand that. Can you imagine what it was like after the global flood on Earth as uh, animals are spreading widely? Mount St. Helens helps us understand a little bit about adaptability and survivability of animals at the blast zone of Mount St. Helens. Okay, let's do a few conclusions and I'll close here. <coughs> uh, you know, the humanist, the person who believe he is in control of everything, 
and is the master of his own destiny. Uh, you know, the humanist is humbled because there is power not under man's control. Somebody else is in control. It's not man. And uh, the Bible tells us he touches the mountains and they smoke. He looks at the earth and it shakes. Um, God's little finger, there's 400 million tons of TNT blast energy, equivalent to 20,000 Hiroshima sized atomic bombs. That's just a small to average volcano from standpoint of human experience. And it causes us to wonder who's in control. We're not in control. God is in control. God is in control of the things we see around us. And it humbles us, and we see this incredible power all around us. You know, Harry Truman, the, the, uh, the man who was 80 years old, he lived next to the volcano uh, in his lodge at Spirit Lake. He refused to heed the warning. The government came to him and said, hey, Harry, you need to leave. You know, the volcano can explode here. And he, but he died on the morning of May 18. His lodge was buried under about 200 feet of avalanche debris. He died. He failed to heed the warning. He's kind of like modern 20th century man. You know, we, uh, uh, we, we, we think uh, we can control our own destiny and, and we can call the shots around us. Uh, God is in control. And God's law is uh, operating in the world that we see. And so man is not. And as I think about the volcano, I think about my ordinary experience. You know, if you would have told me the volcano was going to erupt and was going to um, cause um, pyroclastic flows that would deposit very thin uh, laminated deposits, I would have thought you were ignorant of the uh, uh, of the. Uh, understanding of sedimentation. Or if you would have come to me before the eruption and said, Mount St. Helens is going to explode and cause a uh, all kinds of erosion features, even spillover erosion, creating a miniature Grand Canyon, one uh, 40th the size of, Mount, of Grand Canyon, something like that, I would have got into an argument with you. Or if you would have come to me and said, Mount St. Helens is going to explode and cause all kinds of logs to be deposited on the bottom of Spirit Lake in standing orientation, having the appearance of being multiple petrified forests that came over maybe millions of years, I thought you were visionary. About the only thing I might have agreed with you before the eruption was the notion that trees could float as log mats and could deposit granular uh, and sheets of tree bark and, and could make coal. What did I learn at Mount St. Helens? I learned that God specializes in doing things that I think are impossible. At the volcano, now that we look back on it, things have been accomplished in very reasonable way. That helps me understand the rock layers of earth and the flood that generated the uh, uh, and made things, a uh, uh, global flood. And so Mount St. Hills is kind of a Rosetta Stone. You know the Rosetta Stone from 196 BC. It was discovered and it had uh, the uh, three different languages, cuneiform and Greek, and it allowed uh, us to uh, decipher the uh, extinct. Uh, ancient cuneiform Egyptian language. That's what Mount St. Helens is. It's a Rosetta Stone. The term Rosetta Stone is now used in other contexts as the name of essential clue to a field of knowledge. Mount St. Helens is a Rosetta Stone for deciphering global catastrophic process that the Bible says formed our earth. Yes, Mount St. Helens is a catastrophic event. It is um, uh, an, a major catastrophic event. I believe that the eruption of Mount St. Helens is the geologic event of the 20th century. Now that we're looking back on it, 
we understand this Rosetta Stone and we understand the formation of the earth in a much better way.